like all human beings, I, I, I wake up in the morning and have a certain outlook and feeling that might be positive or negative. But if I fixate on that, then I might ignore other things that are arising and miss a lot of life. And I think that right now, with the world apparently falling apart, that there's a, a more urgent need for that kind of awakened activity. It's released through mindfulness. How come this is so helpful for us? This joy, the reassuring feeling that it's not just the suffering, but there's something else, the joy of life, and that they're not separate from each other. How do I, how do I change my life? How do I reorient myself? towards bigger life, a more fulfilling life, no matter what my circumstances are. And I would say... I just want to quickly thank you for beginning to watch this podcast episode. If you haven't subscribed yet, feel free to do so. would love it if you join our community. You'll also be up to date on the latest content. And this really helps me reach out to more guests. You can also visit our website, centerformindfulness.ca. There's free events about mindfulness and laughter. Hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Kasim Almashad, registered psychologist and mindfulness teacher from the Center for Mindfulness of Canada in North Vancouver. I'm interested in bringing conversations that support positive change, well-being, and mindful living. I'm truly thrilled to introduce today's guest, Melissa Myosin Blacker Roshi. So I, I wanted to go over, even your name has such beauty to it, because we were chatting before we began and before I read your bio. Myosin means a wonderful, bright, was it accomplishment, you said? It's yes, yeah. Myosin. Myosin. Mi Myosin. Yeah. Beautiful. And and I think I mentioned to you, Kasim, it's a an aspirational name, a Dharma name. Mm. It was given to me by my teacher uh, long before I had bright, wonderful accomplishments. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's aspirational because it kind of opens a door to the future. Mm. This is this was his hope for me. Mm. And Roshi, as I mentioned, means uh, old teacher. So mm. it's uh, an honorific that comes. Um, it's it's a, a step beyond sensei which is the oh, Japanese word that actually means teacher. Mm. So, Roshi means an old teacher, teacher. which I now am. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is such a beautiful description. And your teacher's aspiration are for you more than fulfilled. Uh, mm. I have to tell you, you know, I was deeply touched by the, the one chance that I had to be at a training with you back. We were trying to get the numbers 2011, yes. 12. <laughs> Oh with uh, with uh, Florence Milo Meyer and you both really deeply touched me and and opened my heart to want more and share more about mindfulness and teach. So I just wanted to thank you uh, for the role you played, and I'm so thrilled to reconnect. Yeah, me thank too. You. And and uh, that training was aspirational for you, apparently. <laughs> yes, <laughs> as a mindfulness teacher, we love that. Thank you. It, it sure it sure opened me. So thank you. I'm just going to read a little more of your bio for those who are not as familiar with your work. As I mentioned before, you are the uh, abbot and uh, Zen teacher and abbot of the Boundless Way Zen Temple, a school of Zen Buddhism with a practice centers throughout New England. In 1993, and after careers as a violinist, pianist, music teacher, and psychotherapist, you joined the staff at the Center for Mindfulness, founded by John Kabat-Zinn at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. And I think you were there for about 20 years or so, till 2012 or so, right? Uh, her positions at CFM included Director of Professional Training Programs and Senior Teacher and Associate Director of a Stress Reduction Clinic. Her writing appears in a number of collections including Best Buddhist Writing, 2012, and The Hidden Lamp. And she's the co-editor of a book of Mu. Did I say this right? You did. I that did, okay. Well <laughs> <That's> unusual. <laughs> the book of Mu, which is Essential Writings on Zen's Most Important Koan. I would love to get into that as well. Of course, yeah. Her writing also appears in various, various magazines, including Shambhala San, Lion's Roar, and 
Dharma. A warm welcome to you and, and thank you again for this uh, generosity of time and, and sharing your, your wisdom. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Mm. So, so I, I wonder if we can begin way back on your journey, um, how you began this path. And there's a story I wonder about, I think you were eight, nine or so. You had an oh, wow. Yeah, you had some spontaneous experience that led you to this yeah. interest in psychology and, and spirituality. And it may have started before then, I'm not sure, but can you share a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. Thank you. You've done your research. Um, that's wonderful. Yeah, I, um, you know, I was brought up in a non-religious family, a secular family, mm -hmm. and was not taught about any kind of religion, God. Um, mm -hmm. My parents were more politically oriented. Mm -hmm. so they wanted me to be well-versed in social justice and uh, the many ways that people were oppressed. So this was in the 1950s. Uh, mm. And, you know, that hasn't changed that much. I think maybe we're more aware of it now. Yes. But I'm forever grateful to them for orienting me in that direction. Mm. But I also had a kind of, the only thing I can call it now is maybe a spiritual yearning or longing mm. for something more. The experience you talk about was that I was at a, a Girl Scout summer camp for mm. a week. I think I must have been about nine years old. And and I, I had never been away from home. Mm. And we had a, a, a sleepover at the beach on Martha's mm. Vineyard. That's where the Girl Scout camp was, oh, wow. which is a beautiful island off the mm. coast of Massachusetts. And, and I woke up early uh, and went to the beach and just sat down in a meditation posture, but I didn't know that's what it was. And it was really dark. And then the sun started coming up bit by bit by bit, little lights here and there, then all becoming, you know, the big sunrise. Anyone who's seen a sunrise knows what this is like. If you're just sitting facing the water, because mm. in Arthur's Vineyard, the sun was coming up in the east on this particular beach. And just something snapped inside me, something clicked. Mm. And I knew for sure that uh, the world was a safe place. This mm. was in spite of all the things I'd been taught about all the suffering in the world. Mm. So it didn't erase any of the teachings from my parents, but it was also um, this reassurance, like a, a, a reassurance that everything was okay. I, I was very excited about it. I thought, and my first thought, because <laughs> I remember this, because I told my mother about it, was that now I know what grown-ups know, because I knew that I wasn't really keyed in, that grown-ups knew something that I didn't know mm. as a little kid. And so when I saw my, when my mother picked me up at the ferry, uh, I, I said to her, mommy, I saw the sun come up. And she just said, oh, that's so wonderful, honey. Sunrises are beautiful. And I immediately <laughs> knew she didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> so I, I actually shut down at that moment. If my mother, who I adored, couldn't understand me, then maybe nobody could understand me. Mm. But it started me on a, a journey of reading. I was a, 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 a big reader. Mm. And I read everything I could about religion and spirituality. And, and uh, the only thing that made sense to me which I, and I discovered these writings maybe in my early teens was Buddhism. Mm. It seemed like the structure around Buddhism was uh, explained what had happened to me, mm. in it, especially Zen Buddhism, as it turned out later. And then when I was at college at university, the first year when I was a freshman, I took a freshman seminar called Emptiness. Ah, yes. That <laughs> was taught by a guy who um, who later became a friend of ours, a friend of my husband and me. Uh, but at this time, I was just 18 years old. And he taught us how to meditate. Uh -huh. And it was kind of the most wonderful thing that I'd ever experienced. And then I stopped doing it when the class was over. <laughs> <laughs> he also taught us about Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, Taoism. Mm. And, and uh, I, I just loved everything about that, but then, you know, got wrapped up in other things. 
And mm -hmm. it really wasn't until I was in my late twenties that um, that I started doing meditation again. Mm -hmm. And that was with I I received a um, a massage from a massage therapist mm -hmm. who was a Zen Buddhist practitioner, although I don't oh. know about him. And and he said, uh, "Have you ever?" I was on my way, I think, on a car trip a road trip and I was nervous about it and he said well have you ever tried meditation and I said no I did a long time ago. <laughs> not for me yeah uh, yeah and and he said oh well just let me make out your bill and you sit here on the table and just put your hands on your belly and just feel your breath going in and out mm. it was again a very similar connection to that old memory that I kind of mm. put away of the beach and and I, he came back in and he said, how are you doing? And I said, oh, this is great. And he said, well, my Zen teacher is coming to, this was in Hartford, Connecticut, um, is coming to Connecticut uh, from Canada. He was Canadian. Mm. And you should come and see him give his talk. And so I did. And I just thought, this is great. And I immediately went to a workshop on Zen and then did a retreat and was sold. It was very, very quick. Uh, it seemed to answer a lot of questions for me. And that was almost exactly 40 years ago. Wow. Yeah, 41 years ago. So mm. I've been, there was a time when I left my first teacher because of ethical issues with him. Mm. Which was the only time that I stopped practicing Zen. Mm. Uh, but then I found another Zen teacher who mm. um, became my most recent Zen teacher, the one who mm. gave me permission to teach. Um, yeah so so that went that's the line the story yes <laughs> yeah. so it, it began with a moment of uh, like some moment of deep presence some moment yes. where yes. you were able to see something you couldn't see before where even your, your right. mom wasn't able to see what you saw and what was it like if you this this thing about you know What's in plain sight that we miss out on when we're present? Something shifted, it feels, in that moment for you. Yes, it did. And it was partly that um, the, I, the word I would use was reassurance, mm. which when I started actively practicing Zen Buddhism, it, it, that feeling returned. That mm. there, And this is actually connected to what you and I were talking about before we started uh, mm. recording, the, how important it is to act in such a way in the world mm -hmm. that you can be a healing force one can be a healing force in yeah. the world and i think for me that takes having access to both how much the world is full of suffering yeah that was the buddha's very first teaching and mm -hmm. and it, not a problematic teaching he mm -hmm. called it you probably know and many of your listeners know the noble truth of suffering mm -hmm. not the the terrible truth of yeah suffering. yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know oh, we, is, we're gonna get over this um, yeah not the breaking news always no. on TV. it's like right. yeah oh yeah. the torment and especially these days you know there this it, you could we i listen to the radio when i'm driving places mm. uh, but otherwise i don't and just it's an onslaught of yeah. bad news all the time terrible things terrible suffering and you know the so I had access to that growing up from my parents. They were very careful to educate me into the world of suffering, but also um, they were uh, music fans. Mm. They, they didn't play music themselves, but they were really lovers of especially jazz music and, mm. and exposed me to that right away. And there was a joyousness in listening to music that I inherited from them. Mm. And then, you know, this, this joy that came in that very first experience as a child, the reassuring feeling that it's not just the suffering, but there's something else, the joy of life, and that they're not separate from each other. They're kind of like two sides of the same uh, coin. Mm. And that there's a way to experience them both eventually simultaneously. Mm. Uh, like the beautiful sorrow of the world or the joyful sorrows of the world without getting caught in it's just terrible and also without getting caught in everything is wonderful i'm so happy all the time <laughs> <laughs> and and you know the the 
the wellness movement, especially the last 10 or 20 years, has backed away from understanding how mm -hmm. grief and sorrow are part of the whole human experience. And there's this wanting things to be just happy, positive. Yeah. I feel like that's a very dangerous, I use that word on purpose, a dangerous uh, direction. Mm. It's, it, it's not what we started with. It's not how we started mm. uh, with Buddhism, with Zen especially, which is open to, and, and mindfulness the way I was taught mindfulness by my mentors at the University of Massachusetts um, was all about opening to whatever is here. Mm. The same kind of clarity and intention, whether it's so-called negative or positive, it's an experience, yeah. to, right? To to really know uh, rather mm. than... Mm -hmm. So it all connects for me. <laughs> Yeah, I sure did. And it really feels like this uh, paradigm shift, you know, yes. from this, it's all bad out there and, and not going to the other extreme. All is wonderful. Everything is great. And life is rosy. Yes. It's actually, you know, how you're describing it is being in reality, how it is, which has both. Mm -hmm. And that is is the uh, kind of non-dual and, and approach, exactly. isn't it? Right? Yes, and of course. Kind of, we can have both. And for, for those maybe who are not as familiar, can, can you say about this? Like, how come this is so helpful for us? This non-dual, like, it's not either this or that. Like, Yeah, well, you know, I can I can describe how it is for me, how you mm, it. Please, me. yes. Um, because like all human beings, I, you know, I, I wake up in the morning and have a mm. certain outlook and feeling that might be positive or negative. Mm. But if I fixate on that, uh, then I'll be dis if I say I fixate on a positive mood that I wake up with, you know, oh, I'm going to get to talk to Kasim today. I wonder mm -hmm. what that'll be like. That'll be exciting. That'll be mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, then I might ignore other things that are arising yeah. and miss a lot of life. If I woke up and, and felt anxious and worried mm -hmm. about the interview with you, then I would also be missing out on the excitement. Right. Right. So, so if I'm, if I can stay open and curious mm. to, to how things move and change throughout the, the day, both my thoughts change, my emotions change, my physical body changes. And then this, this way of being, which is, I think what mindfulness is all about, allows uh, me to have, uh, I don't know, kind of a really beautiful doubt of my mm. interpretation of what's going on, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I could wake up in the morning and be really anxious and think, I'm just an anxious person. Oh, I've got mm. to change that. I need to fix myself. Mm. But if I am aware of anxiety as a thing that comes and goes and may have a lot of positive attributes to it, might give me some protection in some way, mm. then, then there's all these possibilities these all all these ways to mm -hmm. encounter myself, my husband, my kids, mm -hmm. my uh, students, every the neighbors, the postman, everyone is mm -hmm. worthy of that direct meeting. Mm -hmm. And that's how I, yeah, it, it feels like it gives me choices in how to be with life. Mm -hmm. And then the choices translate into behaviors. Mm -hmm. which can be compassionate behaviors, sympathetic behaviors, um, kind mm -hmm. behaviors. I can have that choice. Not always, because sometimes mm -hmm. I get overwhelmed by, yes. <laughs> by you know, everything. But, but uh, there's a possibility for that. There's ease as you're describing that. Like it's <laughs> there's, right there's as I hear you, and thank you for that really very practical example of you know like meeting today and what would mean if you had a certain idea of like, oh, it's great, or oh, it's going to be anxious. It's like we layer things on our experience rather than be in it. And yeah. And, and I see that actually often in, in, in the you know mindfulness program that I teach, mindfulness-based stress reduction, and also some of my one-on-one -on -one work, counseling work, is at times people have this misconception of like, let's push it down and then i'm happy right like mm -hmm. it's this uh, 
let's not feel that thing, but life is great. But whatever is lurking below is going to just. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> something is going to push it up. Whatever it is, is someone cutting us off from traffic or something? It's if, if we don't need it, it's going to show itself. Absolutely. And, and it's okay for it to show itself. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the invitation. I think yeah. that, um, that we're so afraid of being afraid and we're afraid of being sad and we're afraid of anything that we think we, we begin to form a story about what a mindful person should be like, mm. or what a Zen person should be like. I was just reading an article in the New Yorker that uh, referred to one of the people it was an investigative article about some very terrible things mm. and a, a woman was described as being a buddhist practitioner and the writer said strangely she became tearful when i interviewed her she was oh. <laughs> and I, I thought of course she's not detached she's actually yeah, that's right. Buddhism, right and and that's what we, we get these um yeah. you know when i was teaching mindfulness uh primarily not not zen buddhism I would have these same experiences all the time that you're referring to, you know, that, and it was, there was a lot of self-judgment, which I was also very familiar with. Yes. You know? And I love the the word you used layering mm. because I think there's a sense in us like that little girl on the beach, mm. that story, because it's a yeah. story. You know? I don't really know what happened, but that's the story I told myself yeah. about. <laughs> And I got really depressed after that. That's another story I can tell. Mm -hmm. um, my father died. Uh, poor me. That's another story I could tell. But really, I have these little sense memories that are reassuring about all these things. And then I can feel them in the present moment without using them to construct that layered narrative that you're talking about. Right. I can catch the construction business, my first teacher used to call it. <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> I owe him a lot, even though we are no longer together. Um, but just this, this um, habit, uh, which I think is a, a primate habit of, mm -hmm. of really constructing a reality that isn't the reality that is possible for us as human beings. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a lot of people, I'm sure you had people say this to you in the first class, in the mindfulness class. And mm -hmm. this still happens in with my Zen Buddhist students the first mm -hmm. time they come in for an individual meeting with me, which is part of the Zen tradition. I'll ask them, and I asked, you know, in the mindfulness class, what do you want? What do you want from being mm -hmm. here? And so many people say, I want to be happy. I want to be peaceful. I want to be calm. And then they'll add on. And I don't want to have these terrible thoughts anymore. I want to get rid of my thoughts. And so that's, I, I used to say to people, no, 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 that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm a little more, I think, skilled. And I'll say, oh, that's what you want. Mm. Yeah. So you can just feel that. And maybe you'll discover that there's something else, mm. something beyond wanting your thoughts to stop. And I do say, you know, if you want your thoughts to stop, there's one guarantee you can hit yourself on the head with a baseball. Bat. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, it's they're going to still be with you, but maybe they're not so important. Mm. Maybe, maybe something else is important. It's those little sparks of insight can mm. arise in us like they did when I was young. And then later, many times in formal practice and daily life practice um the the reassuring glimpses the like little accidental openings mm. that we can prepare for by having the discipline of meditation in our lives that's you know that meditation doesn't wake you up but it, it because waking up i think is an accident mm. but meditation makes you accident prone <laughs> you'll begin to notice things like oh the tree outside it's turning orange i didn't see that before mm. or you know the the beautiful blue color on your background of your the room you're in all of these things are available mm. but because we're so busy maintaining these layered narratives uh, we miss them yeah it's like a, a different colored lens we have than what's actually out there it kind of affects yes. what we're seeing that's right and um, so it's you know some people the lenses just go away in a moment and then it can be overwhelming 
Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I like about both Zen and MBSR mm -hmm. is that the taking away of the lenses is, is um, gradual. Mm, yeah. And, you know, even people in an eight-week program, the, the eighth week, they may not really get it. But mm. it, there's something that got laid down for people. And, uh, you know, I, I live in Worcester, which is where the Center for Mindfulness yeah. in the U.S. Uh, has been. And things have changed a little bit. Mm. But there still is a Center for Mindfulness. Yeah. Uh, and so I meet people who are in my classes mm. uh, just casually, you know, at the grocery store or something like that. and they'll say melissa do you remember me <laughs> yeah. say, um you look familiar remind me of where i know you from and then they'll say i was in your class in 1996 or 2005 or something like that yeah. and uh and i don't meditate anymore but my life changed and it was that's what you were pointing to i think these these little flips of um of, of consciousness mm. you know where the paradigm shifts for us as human beings mm. we thought things were a certain way and they're clearly not i, I like how you're describing it as, as, as this um kind of accident almost accident that that can happen rather than yeah. just striving for it because sometimes if people begin the journey they're like okay i'm gonna i'm gonna Right. I'm gonna get there now. Let's go. And there's like this effort yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> like it can be really violent yeah. almost. You know, I'm gonna get there. I'm gonna get there. I'm gonna get there. I have to say, you know, when I began my journey, that that really was my wish. I want to stop my thoughts. Oh, and yeah. uh, it was like I thought, okay, great. Like this is you know, my my first introduction was it's interesting you were talking about books and um earlier on doing martial arts as a teen, and uh my boss at a retail store that I used to work at out of all places, uh, uh -huh. did martial arts and he gave me a book, Zen and the Martial Arts. I think I was like 16 or something, 17. And mm -hmm. I opened it and said, empty your cup. I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> I want that. I want empty cup. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, and you know, you know, you must know that that's based on a story, a very famous Zen story right about a scholar who comes to a Zen teacher and says, I want to learn. And the Zen teacher keeps pouring tea into his cup until it overflows. And then he says to him, you can't learn anything till you empty your cup. Which is such a beautiful metaphor, really. Oh, like if we're so really? full of ideas, even about ourselves, we're full of ideas. Yes. This is who I am. And I see this in the MBSR program. People like, that. you know, we all have that kind yeah. of fixated narrative. This is how I am. And, and then it's like something begins to shift and, and as we explore really like is it i don't know maybe it is yeah yeah maybe maybe not i wonder if we can take a a step for those who are not as familiar with like mindfulness versus zen uh buddhist uh meditation um and bsr like i wonder if you can share your understanding of what is mindfulness and what is zen meditation yeah well you know i was a zen practitioner before um, I met John Kabat-Zinn, who was my first mindfulness teacher. Mm. I remember taking his class, being very excited about it. And, uh, and I was lucky, so lucky that I met him because he, he is, uh, I haven't seen him or talked to him in many years, mm. um, but he was at the time a serious practitioner of Buddhism. Mm. He had been a Zen Buddhist and then he started practicing the insight tradition mm -hmm. and so the way he taught mindfulness was almost like in this juicy buddhist context without mentioning the word buddhism or zen mm. or any of that um, even awakening he avoided those terms and my sense of him as a person who was really a gene is really a genius <laughs> talk mm. about him in the past tense just because i haven't seen him for a while <laughs> <laughs> but you know very strong presence of this teaching of learning how to be present which is what the buddha taught and what um, came to fruition in my opinion in the zen school which didn't really start until about 600 um, the, the in, in mm. china and it and before that uh, it was in india um, maybe you know 600 years before the common era mm. so so the uh, Zen was a combination of um, 
Taoism, which is a Chinese religion or religious practice about uh, embracing nature as a teacher. Mm -hmm. And Confucianism, which was another Chinese practice of being very intellectually oriented towards these same things. Mm -hmm. So those three things came together, Indian Buddhism and Confucianism, Taoism, and that's what Zen uh, mm -hmm. arose from. And it was very much my understanding of Zen from both of my Zen teachers and other trainings is that there wasn't much difference. And I did trainings in other forms of mm. Buddhism too, in, in insight meditation, which is mostly from Southeast Asia uh, with Thich Nhat Hanh, who, mm -hmm. uh, Zen teacher actually, and some Tibetan trainings, which are another version of these same things. They've all come to the West now. So yeah. <laughs> they're worldwide, which is great. Uh, there, there's this capacity uh, to, well, this also is true in Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, mm. a, a kind of way of being still, mm. training yourself to be a receiver of what the world is offering you. And that re receptive quality is what's trained in all of these different forms of practice. I call them practice because it, you can't just read about them. You have to do them, right? So this is a lot of doing of, of and, you know, be still and know that I'm God is a quote from mm. the Bible. There's so many um, places in the world where yeah. the same teaching, uh, you know, Aldous Huxley called it the perennial philosophy because it's everywhere. Mm. Uh, and, and one of my formative books was called The Common Experience. Mm a common experience and it was based on a study that had been done in the UK. Somebody put an ad, the researchers had put an ad in the newspaper asking if anyone had had any spiritual experiences. <laughs> and people wrote in, this was a long time ago before ah. the internet, people wrote in to the PO box and, and they gathered so many that they, they wrote a book about them. And the what they postulated and I really believe this having met so many people who just want their minds to stop or mm -hmm. you know just want to be peaceful don't want to suffer anymore is that this is a common experience this waking up to reality to uh, you know a different reality is Carlos Castaneda wrote a book about yeah. that, that I loved in college uh, that there's this other reality that we're missing because of the narratives the layered narratives mm -hmm. and and that it and everyone has these, but then we forget them mm. because the narratives take over. And once you learn how to be still and present and quiet, mm. then that receiving capacity gets kicked in and there it is. And so we recognize it when it happens mm. instead of pushing it away or saying, well, that something weird happened to me on the subway train. You know, I don't know what that was, but enough of that then we we begin to say oh what happened what happened so i really believe everyone who walked into the stress reduction clinic when mm. i was working there i saw them as um people who were already awake but just mm. didn't know or had forgotten and so little by little that that uh i, I like to call it awakening some people use the word enlightenment or mm. but but i don't think that's helpful because it really is awakening from a dream mm. to something much more tangible and present, the senses, the body. Mm. So back to John Kabat-Zinn, I felt like he had found a way to talk about this mm. using modern English. Right. right. And, and that was so, I learned so much from the Center for Mindfulness and from John and then from my other teachers there. Um, Sinki Santorelli, mm -hmm. Alana Rosenbaum, Ferris Urbanowski, they were mm -hmm. sort of the quartet that taught me how to teach. And, and especially Saki, uh, somehow he took me under his wing and gave me a really hard time. <laughs> 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 and I just am grateful to him for he just wouldn't let anything go. And, mm -hmm. and so now, now I feel like I'm using everything I learned in those 20 years there. Mm -hmm. I teach Zen because it's not that different. But Zen is, of course, in my view, a religion. And that was one of the things mindfulness-based stress reduction was clearly not oh. on purpose, right? Even though some people kind of treated it that way, I think mm. and still do, you know, and mm. worship at the feet of 
of some of these teachers. Um, it was a methodology, which I also think Zen is. Zen is a methodology uh, for becoming receivers of what the world has to offer. Yeah. So uh, one other thing connected to this, you can stop me if you think I'm going off topic. This, this uh, is but, great. Really is giving a, a really a, a deeper understanding of Oh, good. Oh, good. I was hoping I was your question. Yeah. The, um, in, in Zen practice, especially, but this is true all through Buddhism, and John translated it into modern English as everyone is a genius. Mm. You're a genius because you know things about your own perception, your own heart, your own mind that um that nobody else knows you're the expert on your life and right. and that was a translation in my understanding of the um the teaching that everyone is a buddha mm. already already accomplished no mm. need to go anywhere it's just awakening or realization is another word you realize that you've had these things in you forever mm. that, and your job now now that you've recognized them is to uh, become what we call a bodhisattva. That's a, mm. a Buddha means awake, so an awakened one, and mm. bodhisattva means uh, an awakened being. Yes, Buddha are similar, and that the job of a bodhisattva is to heal the world. Mm. So the world is suffering, and bodhisattvas uh, are active forces. Mm. There's and there's a wisdom bodhisattva and a compassion bodhisattva and an activity an enlightened activity bodhisattva and so you become those bodhisattvas whenever you act mm. uh, in kindness in compassion then you're transmitting everyone as i'm saying you because this is true for you and everyone that we encounter mm. everyone has this capacity mm. but but and there's an energy uh, you know the, the energy of chi or ki which mm. you must have noted in martial arts it's a very yes. big thing uh that that chi is um is is in the universe and it gets channeled by human beings into action mm. and i think that right now with the world apparently falling apart because i'm not sure i believe that i think mm. it's definitely transitioning it's not the way it was uh that there's a, a more urgent need for that kind of awakened activity that it's released through mindfulness and through uh, Zen Buddhist and other Buddhist practices. Mm. The the description as you're sharing it, it just feels a selfless rather than you know this <laughs> selfish like I'm gonna get awakened and transcend all pain and I'm right. gonna be just blissed out the rest of my life. And <laughs> you know, you know there there are. Um, a lot of religions that promise mm. that and I've actually seen people like that mm. but um, but I don't 100 percent trust it mm. because I do, it when I meet people like that and get to know them really well mm. there's a lot of suffering you were describing before that's been pushed down yeah rather than released mm. yeah and and I you know I don't know maybe they're happy maybe um, maybe they're doing fine I don't go around and proselytize mindfulness or Zen anymore. Right. <laughs> I think it's really cool, all of it. Um, I'm so happy when somebody shows up who wants to practice it. I, I, I'm i just so thrilled. You know, one of my favorite classes was always class one in the, in the mindfulness-based stress reaction from these people walking in the door and uh, just amazing. Mm. And, and my orientation has always been personally towards trying to understand birth and death you know trying to understand mm. why people suffer uh and so the, again that's not a bad thing to focus on but then the, i don't want to miss um the reasons why are here but i might miss them because i'm looking for a specific thing like stopping mm. my thinking is a great example yeah yeah mm. i guess it, it starts us moving these these uh, you know goals we may have in meditation or our mindfulness journey gets us moving and as we move and we discover that may shift that original 
Well, exactly. I think whatever <laughs> we used to talk a lot about bait and switch at the mindfulness. Clinic. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it looks like I'm going to feel better and I'm going to be healthy and I'm going to be happy and I'll never die. I think that's what it looks like. And I'm buying yeah. in. I'm doing it. Right. <laughs> you know, we we would kind of keep that alive a little bit in the first class. By the second class, it was over. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah no, my honeymoon gonna, ends by second class. <laughs> if somebody comes back, right, right. And, and you know, people can be great bullshit detectors too. Yeah. By the second class, there was a, there's mm. a tr kind of trust that can develop uh, yeah. because people are suffering. And if you, if, if I ignore a person's suffering and say, you know, just do this and then you'll be happy. I actually went to a doctor recently who told me if I followed what she was prescribing, the medications that she was, prescribing, I could live to be 120. <laughs> it took me a while to, to back away and say, I'm yeah. not sure that's the goal of my life. <laughs> yeah, it's just all of it wrapped together. It's so mm -hmm. interesting that way. Mm -hmm. You, you know, the beauty, you know, you're describing about MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction is regardless of, of religion, of belief is, is really what, what helped me for me just really fall in love with it is it's just a human being being with another human being, regardless of beliefs. And mm -hmm. we have, there's some, you know, we have our own differences, but we have our own commonalities too. So yes. we can share things. We have this organ called brain, the mind, and it, can be a source of joy and a source of deep agony. Yes, and right. Then, you know, I, um, a little story. I mm -hmm. love to tell this story. It changes mm -hmm. every time I tell it. When mm -hmm. I was uh, teaching my first class at the Center for Mindfulness, mm -hmm. um, it coincided with my last uh, therapy group. When I was a therapist, I was a specialist in grief. And, mm -hmm. grief. Mm -hmm. and, and I had a job teaching... Um, uh, well, actually leading a therapy group that was also eight weeks long uh, for people whose loved ones had been murdered. Oh, wow. Homicide victims. So th this was homicide survivors, they were called. Mm. I didn't even know what that meant when I interviewed for the job. I thought it was some kind of weird thing. Somebody had been murdered and they came back to life. But this was their families. And, yeah. And so there was one woman in my homicide group, as we called it, who also showed up in my MBSR class. Mm, interesting. She, she she came over to me at the end of class. She said, oh, Melissa, don't tell anybody what happened to my son. I don't want to be the person in this class who lost her son to murder. I just don't want to have that identification. Mm. So she identified herself as a person with um, crippling arthritis. Actually, that was her big thing in the class. Mm. And she dropped out of the homicide group around class four or five. And for me, class four in the MBSR program is a pivotal class yeah. because it's the class where we really help people to meet their suffering directly and not and and show what happens when you don't do that. Mm. Um, so she she, uh, she told me she was dropping out of the homicide support group, and when I asked her why, she said, "I'm tired of that story about myself. I'm much more than a woman who lost her son." And in the eighth class of the MBSR, of that MBSR program, she, uh, when everyone shares, uh, mm -hmm. you know, people who haven't been to an MBSR class, I really encourage you to do it, uh, it with Kasim or anybody who's been trained well, uh, that people share what they got out of the class. And it can be very moving and amazing insights and openings. And this woman said, well, I've been keeping a secret from you all. And then she went ahead and told the story of her son's murder. And, you know, everyone was crying and, mm. and, and sending her all kinds of love. And she said, but I'm more than that person. That was the thing I've learned. And I'm more than my body. I'm more, I, I, I don't, I, I just remember hearing her and thinking, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Mm. And I'd quit, I'd already quit the, homicide job because it was too stressful for me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so i was teaching stress reduction but um uh, but but i just devoted myself then i said this is it and it, it hasn't changed really the forms have changed because i really am much more oriented towards the forms of zen now than i am the forms of mindfulness-based stress reduction 
but not that different. Yeah. You know, this is what I love. The overlap is very strong. Mm -hmm. And I use some of the language that I learned from John and all my other teachers. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I learned the most, I think, that I've really brought into the teaching of Zen is a, a non-hierarchical way of engaging a group in discussion about mm. spiritual matters. <laughs> you know, in, in those, those um, every time we would do any kind of practice, there'd always be a discussion about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, inquiry is what we called it, mm. uh, you know, the practice of inquiry. And, and how to inquire into somebody's experience and bring it out. That was revelatory in Zen practice. Mm -hmm. Usually you only did that with one person in a private meeting. Ah, compared to as a whole group. <clears throat> right. Yeah. So we introduced, my husband, um, who's, who teaches with me, uh, David Reinick Roshi, mm -hmm. he, um, he also did some training with uh, John and Saki mm -hmm. and Ferris. Uh, and he... Um, he, so we brought this practice of inquiry into our Zen groups. And it, 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 I can't even explain what happened, but we just, you know, we do retreats where you don't talk and you don't make eye contact. And then we drop that for a short period when everybody starts talking about what's happening for them. And it was, it's, it's really magic. And it's non-hierarchical because even though the teachers or the MBSR teachers are in control of where the where the conversation goes mm. we're not really in control of it because right. we're dependent almost on the insights from people in the group and so that in our boundless way practice um, we feel like it's a, a new school of zen but it's definitely connected to all the other schools um, there's there's this uh, willingness to share very deep things with other people without a fear that uh, we're going to be humiliated or corrected or talked down to. Mm. And I think that's one of the things I learned from the mindfulness programs that I was teaching and also training people to teach, uh, to, to get that sense of every human being is a genius. Every yeah. human being is a Buddha. When you start seeing that, even people who are irritating as hell, could mm. they be Buddhist too? Yes. <laughs> 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 that talk about a paradigm shift yeah yes so, right yeah so so amazing um amazing learnings about who human beings really are mm. the other side which i think was incorporated into mindfulness-based stress reduction but i definitely did is that in zen buddhism there's the idea that uh, at root we are um you know human beings who have who are used to being angry and afraid mm. that this is built into our dna our um, the way the brain is constructed mm. and it's not a mistake but that there's a way if you embrace anger and fear and blankness which is another thing mm. uh, they transform into their opposites all by themselves so anger turns into um, forceful action you know, healing mm. action mm -hmm. and fear turns into uh, compassion, you know, wow. the, the, so the, there's, there's ways of working with these things. If you leave enough space, which is what happens when you're quiet and still, then mm. these things kind of shake themselves out of being negative into being amazing, mm. real teaching. So never to abandon, uh, oh, and greed, greed is the other, the other thing we're born with. Mm. Uh, just wanting things to be a certain way yeah i remember doing a retreat once where i realized every thought in my head began with the words i want <laughs> <laughs> yes I was like, oh what's that about <laughs> yeah so so just to just not to get rid of those things but to make space around them mm. so there's, there's just the capacity to live a bigger life I think. Mm. no matter what you know this uh, the boundless way, <laughs> as, 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 like when you were sharing this, it felt like wow, this feels spacious, boundless. Mm -hmm. Like I, this this um, you know you were describing this experience of this uh, woman with was grieving a loss, you know, tragic oh, loss, and, and um, it's not like doing these practices all of a sudden. Oh, everything's great, but how it's like this spaciousness of 
yes, there's a mm-hmm. deep, mm-hmm. deep suffering from that loss. And she's right. more than she's more than that. I think you know, that that's that think feels that right. spacious. Well, you know, and one of the um, things that's changed because of the pandemic, I call it the gift of the pandemic, mm. is that uh, we we had to turn on a dime. Mm. We stopped doing in-person practice for three years, and then we started coming to it slowly again. But it's now we have uh, practitioners. You, the old uh, biography of me says that uh, Balasoy has groups throughout New England. It actually has groups all over the world now, yeah. students all over the world, because of Zoom, because yeah. of this technology. And uh, and it, it's so amazing, the spaciousness yeah. of that. You know, I thought the pandemic, We well, we thought when we went on to Zoom, it'd be maybe a couple of weeks. Yes, yeah, same here. <laughs> <laughs> And now, you know, right, Every I think everybody's finding this. So the pandemic is a perfect per- perfect example mm. of the spaciousness we're talking about. Because when it first happened, it was the worst thing that could be yeah. happening. And of course, people died. With, we don't have to diminish, diminish the suffering. Mm. And people still have long COVID and there's all this terribleness. Yeah. And on the other side of it is that you and I are talking and you're in Vancouver and I'm in Worcester. Yeah, and, and and there's an intimacy after three years. We're, it's not weird anymore. Mm. You know, the brain adjusts to that. <laughs> right. So yeah, I have a lot of hope for the future that we're going to adjust to everything and then change what we can change. Mm. And, and it requires this leaning into it, like leaning to the right. feel, <laughs> leaning to the discomfort, leaning yes. in order to to open up. And you know, I just remembered I have a a, a a paragraph from one of your writings I wanted to share and because it really captures what you're sharing right now. And I, I think the listeners would, would appreciate it. So I'm just going to read um, it's, it's from an article about meeting ourselves as we are from mm-hmm. lion's roar. And I, I just love that. So if you, if you live a life of privilege and luxury, you are still subject to aging illness and death. If you're born into poverty, or if you don't conform to white Western standards of skin color, gender identity, religion, or sexuality, then life is even more challenging. Not to mention those of us with chronic mental and physical health problems, or survivors of all forms of violence and conflict that fills this burning world. It can feel pretty overwhelming. And then the, the next part in this article, um, he, he, it's it's like the boundless way I felt as, as now <laughs> I'm rereading it. He, and you share how our hearts yearn for happiness, but life forces us to create survival strategies to protect ourselves from all our suffering. One common defense is to wall off our hearts from further pain. We become numb and withdrawn, or we become sad, depressed, anxious, fearful, angry, and hostile. Poignant way of describing this, like this tendency we all have. Can you share a little more about this, like getting to know ourselves and like embracing some of these things that, ugh. Right. Well, you know, thank you for reading that because I didn't remember it. <laughs> listening, going, ooh, that's pretty good. That's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. But, but I do, as you continued to read it, I remembered writing it, and I remembered, you know, just making that list mm. of all the forms of suffering, and not wanting it to be an exclusive list, mm. right? Because there's so many, so many ways that we can take the world's definition of us. Yeah. And use it to hurt ourselves. Mm. <laughs> I'm just thinking, well, so for me, you know, um, my heritage is Jewish mm. and I'm a woman mm. and I'm short. I mean, there's a whole list of things that I get oppressed for mm. just in this current culture uh, and for probably hundreds of years. And and there's a way to um, to use those external definitions Mm. as a way to match any self-hatred we have or low self-esteem you know it's like they they go hand in hand and yep yep the way i'm treated 
well, they're right about me because I'm just a terrible, terrible person. And, you know, because I'm fill in the blank. Mm. And so the healing part of this opening for me is again, loosening ourselves from, it's not just these externally generated constructions, Mm. but the external constructions that the world places on us. And I'm just suspecting uh, that you may know some of these things too. <laughs> uh, but I don't want to make any assumptions. Yes. But uh, this weekend, my husband and I went to see the movie Barbie, mm. which uh, one of my students is a film critic. And he he wrote to me and said, you have to see this. It's a Zen movie. And I thought, Barbie is a Zen movie? He was, is absolutely, he was absolutely right, because it's mm. all about the externalization of these oppressive stories. Mm. It, it's so smart and so clever. Mm. And there's one monologue um, that a, a Latinx woman uh, says in a big, big pivotal moment about what it's like to be oppressed. And I just was in tears. I, wow. You know, the people who wrote this, Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach, wow. who are both wonderful filmmakers, um, they know, they know that all of these things, it's possible, the whole movie is about breaking free mm. of, of these horrible, oppressive, narratives Mm. and to and and it keeps going i mean it's just amazing uh if 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 you can deal with that much pink i think (laughs) (laughs) that's only part of the movie part of the movie Uh, it's just so impressive that this is in the culture Mm. as a possibility that liberation you know things have gotten so bad around Mm. oppression that these spots of light are breaking through and, uh, and I feel like that's what we're doing when we're teaching mindfulness or Zen. Mm. Um, we're letting things that people have always felt and been suspicious of mm. be seen through. And that was certainly going back to my original experience as a little kid. I really thought this was a secret that grownups knew. It turned out that it both was and it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And the and and it's it's inherently liberating. Mm. And then you can go out and do stuff, you know, what whatever you were born to do. So a person of color has an opportunity. Uh, a person who's oppressed because of gender issues has an opportunity. Mm. And we and each one of us, I remember teaching a retreat for um people where half the group were indigenous. It was in mm. Canada. And, and a big uproar arose about, well, this is all for privileged people, which I think also led to some of that writing. Mm. And I, I really, I sat with it a lot uh, because I wanted to be open to that amount of anger and distress. Mm. I could connect to it, but it was unique. You know, being indigenous in Canada and uh, North America, and even in South America, is, uh, is its own thing. Right, it has unique um, difficulties, mm. and I realized that my job was to help people find the thing that they needed to do. That that, that the thing I needed to do was not go out on the picket lines anymore, and mm. not um, not protest and try to teach people how to be less sexist or less whatever. Mm. But it was finding people who were engaged in this work already because of their own history and finding ways for them to be useful in the world mm. and supporting them. And that, that all that, so I told the group that, and actually it got through to a lot of people. And we had a discussion about, uh, you know, it was a retreat, <laughs> but we had all these group dialogues. Uh, mm. So, so it, it was very exciting. I don't know what's happened to any of them. That was a long time ago, uh, mm. but uh, I um I just it it keeps clarifying for me when I see how much suffering there is in the world. What can I do? Mm. Oh, I can do this. I can let Kasim interview me and maybe something I say or something he says or reads will touch somebody's heart somewhere and it'll wake them up and I can do this. Mm. I can I can help the world. Mm. That's my hope. Yeah. That is that is uh, an image that I hold dear in my heart. This like, can we each be little ripples, tick tick tick, into yes. this pond of humanity? Whatever we can do, yeah, you know, just yeah. ripples, ripples of of creating 
um, meeting our own suffering and That's right. embracing it gently, lovingly, and then uh, connecting with ours, uh, you know, yeah, playing exactly. a role in this world. Well, that's that's why I brought up the Barbie movie because I yeah. I, I know I I read an interview with the director Greta Gerwig who also mm. wrote this script with her husband, um, and she had no idea it would catch on the way it has. It's like, you know, the most popular movie in years, <laughs> and and it, it's uh, it's really touching people. It also speaks to men's oppression, and yeah. and it, it's it's just amazing to to see that this could even happen. And so she said the same. She thought it should be a little movie that a few people would see and maybe would cause these little ripples. But some of us are talented enough to do more than cause ripples. Like they're yeah. tidal waves. This is a tidal wave. And and who knows, you know, may this podcast grow mm. and grow and grow and mm. get more and more listeners and viewers because this is your portal. This is how you get to, to heal the world. I'm just so impressed with you. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it, something called you to it, this, right? Yes, this means so much coming from you. It really does, because that, that's that's this. Um, it really brings me joy to to share this work. It, it really does, and uh, just getting the opportunity to uh, whoever is interested in possibilities. That's be, right. That's to right. Explore. You're, you'll engage more people than I think I ever will. Mm. Uh, that's the way it should be. Mm. You know, the, the, these ripples or tidal waves or whatever they are. I love the water images. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll maybe, I'll keep this metaphor going, they'll drown out mm. some of the depression. Yeah. So that's just not possible anymore to behave in the way some people do. Mm. Yeah, that's, wouldn't that be amazing? And because we're, our brains are constructed in ways that keep war and oppression going. Mm. We have to practice. We have to do things that circumvent that. Mm. Or, or we'll just be pulled down mm. to the deeps. <laughs> deep yes, places. it's so easy. To, especially <laughs> with technology and our phones. And it's like it's so easy not to sit and look within. And which is really so easy not to. Uh, right. which really takes us to the practice itself of creating the time. Sometimes there's a challenge in, in a busy world, like I don't have time to sit for 10 minutes and uh, yeah. it's stressing me out to think I have to create 20 minutes or half an hour or 40 minutes. That's right. Oh my goodness. Yes. Um, th that's a typical thing that uh, I know that's what stopped me at the, at the beginning. I'm like, ah, where yeah. am I going to fit this? And right. I've discovered just my experience. I, I can't afford not to. Like, That's, it is for me too. Yeah. And you know, there's another thing. There's a um, a beautiful Buddhist text from the 17th century that talks about all you have to do is um, is sit once, mm. and you've accomplished everything. <laughs> that, that it, it really takes a load off of people who have that same thought. I don't have time for this. Like I, I don't have time to go to the gym, you know. Mm. And and my nutritionist said to me but you have time to uh, stand up and sit down. That's enough. <laughs> you just, know, you're, just starting. Yeah, just doing yeah. something for a moment, even mm. a moment, everything is already accomplished. And, mm. and I, I, I love to tell people that because, oh, I, it, I had a, one of these paradigm shifts when I was teaching MBSR because I would mm. ask people in the second class, so how, how much did you listen to the recording this week? And, you know, uh, and uh, people would. <laughs> and, and then and then I started to get interested in not how much people did, but what they did instead. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, because it was clear because my first very first class was uh, in a, a low income part of Worcester and mm -hmm. They didn't practice at all, the folks who came to this class. It was a free class with free childcare, free transportation. And half of them dropped out because there wasn't a lot of uh, energy mm -hmm. practicing. Mm -hmm. But the ones who did stay were amazing. I'm so grateful for that assignment. I did that for a few years. Um, but that was where I learned that it didn't matter whether they did the formal practice. And I think I believe in formal practice. I think it's yeah. really important. 
but but not if it's not if there's a barrier of I can't do it it's too mm. much right so to release into well I stopped at a traffic light and felt my breath for a moment mm. you know or I held my newborn baby and I just sat for half an hour breathing but that's not meditation you know that it, right and so that, that's the paradigm shift that that it's actually possible 24 hours a day yeah yeah, that, that I, 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 to look like something. Yeah, I, I love the description of formal and informal. You know how, how yeah. formal is. You know the, the time portion we're choosing to to sit or lie down and meditate or however we're meditating or standing, and, and then the informal really is rest of the day. Of it is. It the is brushing of the teeth. And, uh, and the other thing too yeah. is you know when people are doing formal practice we could be spacing out yeah. songs to ourselves and who cares if it's 25 minutes of going over, you know, an episode of TV or singing a song that you heard on the radio. There's another way of thinking about it that um, it's the quality of the meditation, mm. so the quality of being fully present that mm. can happen in less than a minute. And yeah. then that's what people start taking with them through the day this possibility is no, I don't, I think the current research is that nobody can focus continuously. There's always a, like a going out and a coming back and a going, yeah. out and coming back. And, and sort of to, to just let that process happen. Mm. There, there's, a, there is a lot of ease in it, as you said earlier. Mm. I, I guess it's being willing to um, create that space, being willing to, let's see what happens. Yeah, a, well, and you, you can see why uh, people wouldn't do it. Yeah. Because it, like in the paragraph you read, these defense mechanisms of shutting down have been mm. really effective. They've helped us survive. So why would we open up? Yeah. So I think whenever there's somebody in a class or in a, a Zen group who um, who's willing to turn and face and meet, that's, oh, that's delightful to me and rare. Not mm. everybody wants to do it. Yeah. Yeah. But mm. once they do, and once they do, there's sometimes a lot of pain arises. Mm. So to be able to be there with the pain and normalize it, of course, mm. you know, been holding back for so long. Yeah. Yeah. But the, that's a default. It is the default. Um, yeah. For many people. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I think it's the brain's protective default. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think mm. it's true. Gosh. Yeah. Would it be possible to do a, a short few moments of, of, of sit? So those maybe who haven't experienced, like what does it mean to actually sit? And uh, some of the listeners are already aware of it. It uh, can be a, a chance to practice. Would that be? Oh, I'd be happy to do that. Yes. Would you love know, that. I, I used to do that all the time when teaching MBSR. In Zen practice, we don't do that so much. It's mm. mostly silent without yeah. um, a teacher's voice. But uh, again, another little piece we integrated into Boundless Way is mm. that often we'll lead a, what we call a guided contemplation mm. of some workshop or class or retreat. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so I'm happy to do that. Anything you want me to focus on in particular? Whatever's arising for you. <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, we'll do. And, and length of time, maybe five minutes or so. That's yeah. great. All right, well, let's begin then by finding uh, an upright posture mm. as much as that's possible. So uh, perhaps you're sitting in a chair. If you can't sit up, you may be lying down, doing whatever can feel supportive to your body right now in this moment. So I'm going to use the example of sitting in a chair, letting your feet touch the ground right at the soles of the feet and letting the buttocks be back, the belly forward, and letting the whole upper torso rise up from the base of the spine. So feeling a sense of being upright and present in this body. And even if you're not able to get to a sitting position, imagining that you were in a posture that reflected your inherent dignity as a human being letting the head rest on the neck, the chin a little tucked, letting the hands rest on the lap. 
in whatever posture feels right for you. And you can have your eyes open or closed. Maybe if they're open, just gazing down softly at whatever's in front of you. If they're closed, noticing the feeling of being absorbed in whatever is arising in the body and the mind at this moment. So one of the first things we can be aware of is the feeling of breathing in the body, because all of us are breathing. And we've been breathing since the moment we were born. And we'll continue that sensation of feeling present to the breath all through this particular little moment of meditation. You don't have to make the breath happen. You've been breathing your whole life. There's no effort involved. But if you notice that you're making an effort to breathe, appreciating that feeling of effort, and then letting the mind rest in the feeling in the body of breathing, whatever you notice, wherever the air may be coming into your body. Maybe it's at your nostrils or at your mouth and wherever the breath is leaving the body. And being aware of sensations right there in the head, the nostrils, the mouth, the feeling of breathing in and breathing out. Maybe it's quick, maybe it's slow, it doesn't matter. feeling the refreshment of the in-breath and the release of the out-breath. And then slowly moving awareness from the nose and the mouth to the throat, where you also may feel sensations of breath. And of course, the chest area and the upper back, which expand with each in-breath and deflate slightly with each out-breath. You don't have to make this happen. Just surrender to the sensations of breathing. The ribs expanding and contracting, the lungs expanding and contracting in a rhythm that you don't have to choose, letting the breath breathe itself. And then maybe sensing at the base of the lungs, the diaphragm muscle, which is also moving to keep the breath going. It's moving up and down it's flattening and curving to allow in-breaths and out-breaths to enter the body and leave the body. And the muscles of the abdomen are also responding by inflating with the in-breath and deflating with the out-breath. And so wherever you felt a sensation that you could stay with, maybe at the nostrils or the mouth or the throat, at the torso with the lungs, the back, the ribs, the diaphragm or the abdomen, letting your mind rest in that place for just a few more moments, not making anything happen, letting what's happening happen in-breath and out-breath, over and over, in your own rhythm, in your own time. And when the mind moves away from the sensation of breathing, maybe it goes to other physical sensations or thoughts or emotions, noticing that, not a problem. This is what our attention does. It shifts to thoughts, sensations, and emotions. Realizing that you've shifted away and as if it were a little moment of awakening, 
making a plan to return, returning to the sensation of breath in the body. So again and again, breathing, getting lost in other thoughts, emotions, or sensations, waking up and returning. Sometimes this practice is called returning to the breath. And then when you feel ready, raising or opening your eyes and noticing how you're feeling right now. I, I, I want to know, or like continuation, my mind is like, oh, I, I want more. <laughs> <laughs> yes. well, and, and you know, in terms Bum, of what we're just talking about, yeah. To create a hunger yeah. for this experience. That's yeah. just what that massage therapist did for yeah, me. Yeah, it's just like right? the... I want more. Yes. How can I get more? Yeah. Thank you for this beautiful guidance. I, I can feel um like a settling, like a couple of minutes into it, I can sense when my shoulders just went, you know. I, I wasn't like trying to, it just felt yeah, right, right. The there's, release there's, a, there's, a, there's an arriving here yes uh, with um the different sensations i notice in my body the heart beating and thoughts would come but it's like this um this finding stillness in the middle of all of it in those moments was uh refreshing yeah like well and you know too custom that mm. you, you know this from teaching mbsr mm. it's not always that way some yeah. people can feel a lot of anxiety around yeah this meditation like this or tears can come yeah the mind just comes in and yanks us away and all of that's normal too yeah to know that there's nothing there's no i always have people say to me i don't know how to meditate and yeah. it, it's like they think those things aren't allowed and yeah that's yeah part of it right yeah so any response mm. so is correct all of it and that's so freeing like we're yes. really freeing just which is relates to what you shared earlier just meeting ourselves as we are and yeah. sometimes as we are as the, as the body's relaxing the mind is calm sometimes we're hanging on by like <laughs> by a thread <laughs> that's oh, yeah. how the mind is and that's it <laughs> that's and right. it, it's it's like uh seeing that the coming and going of all of it like that that's the part that's uh, go back to the boundless way that you described like mm, feels like i yeah. uh, increasing the capacity to be with all of it yeah 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 well Thank this you. this has been so so enriching and, and and time like truly flew by um and and i'm wondering um like i'd love to to continue chatting for like hours <laughs> I, I, really no, just, uh, I really such a treat and uh, I, i'm wondering um anything else you're wanting the listeners to know um if they've started a mindfulness journey and stopped or zen practice and stopped or if they're considering it or anything else that you're wanting to share just before we end well you know i, I think we've we've really been circling around this very thing how do i how do I change my life? How do I reorient myself towards uh, a, a bigger life, a more fulfilling life, no matter what my circumstances are? And I would say um, finding a way to take an eight-week class or everyone is welcome to practice with us at Boundless Way, it, it, just a little taste of some kind of structure mm. is a wonderful thing. And, and I really encourage everybody to do it. And of course, people can reach out to you for MBSR. They can reach out to me for Zen. Um, it's very easy yeah. to get to me. I don't have many barriers up. So yeah. um, so just just don't, feel free. You know, mm. make sure you, we say in Zen practice that um, there are three jewels or three treasures mm. that are the foundation of every practice. I know you know what they are. Uh, and they're, the Pali words for them or the Sanskrit words are Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Mm. and buddha doesn't mean that little cute guy <laughs> sitting with a little smile uh it means you you need to bring yourself to this so you're the buddha you're the awakened one and, and mm. the recognition of that and it, you you have to be part of the formula 
or nothing happens. The Dharma means the teachings or the truth of reality. So you also need guidance. Everyone needs guidance. You need to bring yourself to it. You need a guide. And then Sangha is means the community. It mm -hmm. used to mean just the community of practitioners, but it means a community of people who can support you, uh, whether it's in meditation or psychotherapy or mm -hmm. anything, anything you need. So to have those three, if, you don't, if you're missing one of them, it's hard to maintain a practice. Mm -hmm. And what um, the forms of Zen and the forms of MBSR do is they create uh, a Dharma and a Sangha uh, nodes for the Buddha. <laughs> so there's you, there's a teacher or teachings, and there's a community to practice with. Mm. So find them. If you don't have them, find them. That's mm. my that's my advice. G giving giving it a chance. Yes. And, and kind of um, this is the, the the approach I so appreciate. It's like giving a chance and deciding for oneself. Like this might be for me. This may may not be for me. And either way, it's okay. And there are and, so many, so many forms uh, of authentic practice available. Yeah. And we can be good shoppers. Yeah. Uh, if there's even a, like that doctor I talked about who told me I could live to 120. I did not buy what she was selling. <laughs> <laughs> My little bullshit detector went. <laughs> and so, you know, you know, you trust yourself. This is the Buddha in you. Trust yourself to know how to make that choice and mm. just keep looking until you find a home where you can settle and learn. Mm. And how can they find you? Um, I'll put it in the show notes, but uh, yes. the website, if you can share the website where they can reach you out. Yeah, it's really easy. It's boundlessway, one word, mm -hmm. dot .org. Boundlessway.org. And, and there's a um, lots of information. There's talks that my husband and I have given, links mm. to other groups around the world. And also there's a contact us page mm. you can write. And I almost always get those emails. Mm. Um, some of my uh, teacher trainees get them, but mostly it's me. So if you want to talk to me directly, that would be how to stay in mm. touch. And it, and it gives all the instructions for Zoom practice. And, and uh, we practice, we have uh, about 12 practice periods a week at our various Boundless Way locations. So morning, evening, middle of the day, uh, you can find something mm. and this is including zoom online it's all on zoom, zoom. Uh, okay. even our in-person stuff is hybrid and also oh, on zoom. Okay. It we, gives we just that have choice. a little bit of in-person stuff that you have to be here uh, yeah. to participate in mm. most, most stuff you can do long distance yeah, yeah. we have I'll, somebody who, who in malaysia who gets up early in the morning and that's late at night for us <laughs> and there's you know other people it's really amazing that the way mm. people have found uh, these ways to practice mm. thank you for being such a such a bright shining beacon <laughs> so, truly okay. and for having touched so many lives and inspired so many and you continue to do so i really want to thank you from the depths of my heart for who you are what you've done and your generosity of time and sharing wisdom and, and truly walking the talk, like truly living this. And um, I, I really deep bow to you of, of gratitude. And, okay. I, and I have to say it takes one to know one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just so happy to have re-met you and what a wonderful 90 minutes of my life uh, this is what gives me joy meeting mm. people who are um, like-hearted i would say mm. so you too kasim please keep doing the work you're doing wonderful so inspiring thank, thank you so much for the joy that you brought really appreciate your time and i want to thank all the listeners for for their open uh ears and willingness to just explore these ideas if you found this useful and helpful please feel free to share and if you haven't done so you're welcome to subscribe to get more content my intention is to keep sharing stories uh, that can inspire and create positive change thank you everyone may your moments be full of ease and may you be present in as many of them thank you, thank you.